On behalf of everyone at WNET, congratulations to Steve Adubato and the Caucus Educational Corporation on 25 great years of broadcasting. Hi, I'm Bob Garrett. Hackensack University Medical Center believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important health issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Medical Center, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, the law firm of Gibbons PC, Verizon Communications, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. This is One on One. That's good acting, yeah. I get that a lot. I go to Atlantic City all the time. Like, are you the guy? I go, no, I'm not. This is one you can't afford to miss. They thought that I would survive it, but I knew I would. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. As you can tell, we're coming to you from our Tisch WNET studios here at Lincoln Center. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Richard Wolf, who is the author of Renegade. The Making of a President, also the executive editor of MSNBC.com and also one of the political analysts you will see on a regular basis on MSNBC. How are you doing? I'm good. A bit tired, but I'm good. <laughs> it's, a, it's getting to the end of the election, so everything's coming to a head, but um, great to be here. Thanks for having me, Steve. Good to have you. We should make it clear that we're doing this right, right before the 2012 presidential election. We'll be running this before and after as well. Um, let me ask you. We don't know, obviously, who's going to win this race. And it's funny, I wanted to ask this question either way, but maybe it does depend who wins. Mm -hmm. The biggest thing you'll take away from this election so far, up until the week before, is? Biggest and does it thing. depend upon who wins, as to what they answer that question? No, no. Uh, some things, actually most things about an election, you learn in hindsight. Uh, and actually, that's why I wrote Renegade from the last election. I felt, even as I was covering it, there was so much that I wasn't seeing and that I could get a glimpse of and wanted to go back into and tr sort of unfold. Excuse me, I didn't do, I did a disservice. Renegade looks back at the 2008 presidential election. You had really unfettered access right, right. to the president and some of the key players there. I'm sorry. Right. And, and I covered the 2000 election, mostly covering Bush, 2004, mostly John Kerry, and then 2008, this weird new senator with a strange name, and, and I covered him from start to finish for Newsweek magazine, and, and you know, you do learn, not the first time around, but maybe the second or the third time around, that, that most of the story, it's like an iceberg, it's out of view, and you know it's there, you just don't really know the shape of it. This cycle, I, I, I have a gut feeling where I think the hidden story is. Uh, I think the story is going to be driven by the economy, and I think we kind of know that the economy is big, but what we're not focusing on is how economic attitudes have changed very rapidly in the last couple of months. You can see it in certain points of data, but everyone's so focused on the top of the iceberg, which is where, where today's polls are, or what someone said on TV yesterday, or the debates, mm. that they're missing the bigger trend underneath that. And the other piece of it is, is how voting is changing. People aren't voting just on election day anymore. They're voting for days and weeks before. That's gonna make election night very difficult for people in our business because we're used to getting exit polls and they're kind of reliable. Well, if you've got 20, 30% of a key state voting beforehand and those votes have to be counted mm -hmm. and they're not showing up to the election, you know, patterns of behavior are changing. They're changing in voting just as they are in TV and online and everywhere else. So the bigger trends are things that we don't see until we kind of look back. And then there's all the inside juice and the gossip. That's, that's what we do in books too. Let me uh, ask you this about President Obama. As we do this program, <clears throat> President Obama, whether he wins or loses, still the relevant question. Yep. The biggest misconception about Barack Obama that most people have that you would like to disabuse them of is? 
Uh, the biggest from thing, the access that you have. Yeah, yeah. The biggest thing is that uh, everyone feels that they know this guy, right? You know, he's out there all the time. You hear a lot from him, and that's intentional. And, and for people who like him, they feel there's this emotional connection. I guess there's an emotional connection the other way with the people who hate him. He is, though, an incredibly disciplined performer. And so the public persona that you see of him, this is a big contrast with Bush, public persona of, of Barack Obama is really strikingly different from the private person. Um, there are lots of things that you cannot do, you, ways of speaking, sense of humor, um, uh, flashes of emotion. And admittedly, f with him, the flashes of emotion are not expressed in a kind of, he's not, these aren't Clintonian eruptions. But there's a whole pub public aspect to him which is very tightly controlled. And in private, there's a normal person there. With Bush, and I got to know President Bush very well as well, you know what? The public and the private were the same. Mm. <laughs> what you saw in public, I mean, maybe he didn't you know, speak with his mouth full while he was eating, which he would do in private, but there weren't that many differences. It's different. It's just different for him. It's different because of his character, and I think, let's face it, it's different because he's the first African-American president. Let's talk about the, the cable wars. Um, a few years back, I spent a lot of time on MSNBC, yep. mostly with Joe Scarborough when he had the nighttime show. Mm -hmm as a regular contributor, and um, I don't think it's changed uh, what I'm about to ask you. In fact, it's gotten more intense. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that strikes me, particularly in prime time, mm -hmm. is if you watch Fox News or you watch MSNBC, very predictable from my point of view, mm -hmm. in terms of, um, as, they're, as they're watching, we're watching some of the coverage of uh, Benghazi. Uh -huh. If you're watching Fox News and the coverage of it, or it's per their perception of it, they, would, it was, they were leading with a lot of the criticism of the administration. On a lot of the MSNBC programs, it was not the lead program. Vice versa, the screw-ups on the Romney part went the other way. And, and on a regular basis, here's the question. It, it, point of view. Uh -huh. Is it clear that in prime time that not just the host but an entire program has a general point of view and, and that you're a part of that? Or is uh, that a too simplistic a view of it? Yeah, we, we strongly dispute the idea that we're kind of mirror images of each other, right? The two networks. The, the Fox and MSNBC are mirror images. Um, obviously, there are, there are different prisms on the world but we actually, we passionately believe. At MSNBC. At MSNBC, <laughs> that we actually have a different approach to programming and to journalism. And, um, and that's actually what our audience wants. It's not just something we think of ourselves. If you look at the research of the two different audiences, yeah, the most obvious thing is this ideological divide. Although, frankly, there's more people in the middle and overlap. I mean, there are people who watch both. They do exist. Um, I do. But Right. And you're not the only one. And I watch CNN. Right. So there is that. But we also, our audience expects us to come with the facts. They expect us to come with research. They expect us to come with the tools of journalism. And the shows that we have that are really successful are smart, deep, dive shows. I, I defy anyone. You may not agree with Rachel Maddow, but her show is smart. She's she smart. She digs deep. And that is our model. When you look at the kind of shows we've launched recently, uh, Chris Hayes, Melissa Harris-Perry at the weekends, you know... She's had Melissa here I, a couple weeks ago. She's brilliant. Right. I'm not... I, I, I'm, She's an academic. I'm a former print guy, and we would, you know, look, the print cliche about TV is that it's all superficial, cable even more so. And, and when you read the print reviews of cable TV, it's, very, it, it's really lazy to say, well, it's all superficial and it's all just a mirror image of each other. I think there is a model that suits Fox News and its audience, and it's actually more opinionated and less fact-based than our approach. And that's no disrespect to them. There are great journalists, great reporters I have huge respect for, and ratings. personal friends with, and great ratings too. That model suits their audience. Our audience wants smart and deep 
and fact-based, they also want the point of view. And, and our point of view range is slightly bigger as well, right? You mentioned Joe Scarborough. That's one of our best shows. And, and you know, Morning Joe. Morning Joe has this range of opinion. What people love is that dynamic around the group. And the seriousness, the smarts that it brings to morning TV. So we, um, it's a bit more nuanced than that. And I think our audience gets mm. it. I do read a lot of, of the, the equivalents and, and I think that underestimates why both networks have been successful in finding their formula. You've got to understand what your audience is looking for. And it's not just mm. the opinion and the analysis and the commentary. Fair point. MSNBC.com, executive editor, describe for, as we do this program, again, it's only been about a month that you said, right. but in the new year, 2013, as this program will be seen, big things ahead, describe yes. it. Well, now, MSNBC was created many years ago, 16 years ago, as a joint venture. MS was Microsoft, NBC, uh, NBC and uh, it started out as a joint venture a few years ago, several years ago, in fact. The, the two sides parted ways on TV. It took us until last summer to take control as NBC and MSNBC of what we do online. There was a very successful website called msnbc.com, general news site. It's now called nbcnews.com, which is a better reflection of what they are and what the site is and, and what NBC News is. That means for MSNBC, we get to create, I get to create a whole new space online in the, all digital platforms mm. um, that represents what we do on TV and speaks to the bigger community that, that um, considers us a part of who they are. So we're building a home for them. And that's, that's a wonderful opportunity. It's like it's the 1990s, but I've learned all the lessons that there could be uh, from you know, search and from social networks. Uh, so building a new thing for a big media brand at this time is a, is a rare privilege. It's very exciting. Before I let you out of here, a documentary uh, coming out called uh, By the People. Talk about that. Well, By the HBO, People right. By the People was the uh, documentary of the 2008 campaign. Right. Uh, it's you still had a with, role there. Uh, I had a role there and actually in uh, a similar documentary on HBO uh, on the Bush campaign in 2000 called Journeys with George. Right. You know, these behind the scenes documentaries are, uh, that was his title by the way. Um, <laughs> th these behind the scenes, you, you see these poor reporters, I was there. Uh, who are out there every day, it's, it's brutal. I mean, it's tough for the candidates, they've got to perform, journalists have to as well. It, it gives you an insight into this weird pressurized cabin that people stay in. Uh, what you see on air in the newspapers is a tiny fraction of that experience. It's great to share it. We appreciate you very much coming in. Uh, Richard Wolf, who is uh, the author of Renegade, The Making of a President, executive editor of msnbc.com, a uh, regular contributor as a political analyst to MSNBC. Um, I want to wish you all the best and thank you for thank coming. Thank you. Thanks, all Dave. Best. This is one-on-one -on -one from the Tish WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Thank you. If you would like more information on this program or if you'd like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Visit us online at oneonone.org. Or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. There he is. Dan Loria plays Gene Shepard in A Christmas Story, the musical at the Lunfontaine Theater. How you doing? Great, great. It's great I mean, me you. in a musical, you know, that's... <laughs> wait, wait, why? Hold on. <laughs> I can't sing a note. Wait See, a you think all us Italians can sing. We can't. I know, I'm this proof. Italian can't <laughs> sing. <laughs> we got something in common there. By the way, set this up for us. For, by the way, I know those of you watching right now, you do know that you recognize uh, Dan from the Wonder Years way back, um, played Lombardi. We were talking about before we got in the air. You loved that role? Loved it. Loved it. For an old jock to play Lombardi and the people we got to perform for... Uh, like I was telling you, one night. Set that was, up real quick. Uh, one night. I know, we'll was, talk about the play in a minute, oh, but sure, we got to do this. Sure. No, I'm sorry. No, it all part of Broadway, you know. But uh, to perform for Yogi, Hank Aaron, and Frank Robinson, they were all sitting next to each other. And there was a line in a play where Lombardi actually said, we're going to be the Yankees of professional football. 
I, I said it right at Yogi, and he almost killed Hank Aaron. He was giving him the elbow and the ribs. And to have moments like that, and to see all those great icons come. And everybody had a story about Coach Lombardi. You know, they, they would talk for uh, a minute and it'd be something funny, and then they all ended up with a tear in their eye, you know. Look, two years before that, I played Hoffa. Nobody wanted to talk <laughs> about anything, you know. Oh, so. uh, uh, no, exactly. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Boy, you've had a heck of a career. Set this up for us now. How do they get you for this musical? What do they say? They say, let's get Dan. He yeah. can sing. <laughs> well, He's versatile. You know, it's, um, it's all because of personal contact. I'm working on a new TV show, Sullivan and Son, and Peter Billings. That just got renewed. Yes. We got picked up again, oh. thank God. On TBS. TBS, Thursday nights. I'm sure it'll be next year. But the producers, uh, 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 Peter Billingsley. And Peter Billingsley was the original Ralphie in the movie A Christmas Story. Mm. And Peter is the producer of the play. So he called me and he had seen Lombardi. That's how I got the job on the TV show. He and Vince Vaughn are pot partners. And they called me and said, do you want to be in the musical Christmas Story? And I said, Peter, I have the worst voice in the world. I, 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 you know, I have a bad ear from the service. I said, I don't even sound good in the shower. He said, no, you'll be Gene Shepard. You'll be the narrator. So I had to go from a Vince Lombardi voice, which is supposed to scare you when I say mm -hmm. hello, to Gene Shepard is supposed to make you sit at ease. You know, so it's a great. That's how it all evolved. As we do this right now, it, it's your dinner hour, if you will. Yeah. You're, you're in rehearsals right now. Yeah, we're in rehearsal right now. Matter of fact, we move into the theater tomorrow. It's interesting. We're doing this show. Um, I've been saying all, for the last two days we were taping. We're right before the 2012 presidential election, yeah. uh, which is not relevant to this. So you guys are opening on the 19th of November and have a long run on the Lunfontaine Theater. You're right. We go from. Uh, we actually open for previews on November 5th at the Lundfontein on 46th Street, and uh, as of now, we're scheduled to close December 30th. Let me ask you, I want to little, ask you a little bit about your uh, background. Where'd you grow up? Long Island, Lindenhurst. Jet fan? Jet and Giants. I'm, I'm, I hope I live long enough to see the Super Bowl when they both play each other. You Same know? here. Yeah. When did you know that acting would be your professional life? Well, I... I didn't do a play till my junior year in college, and then from Where? Uh, Southern Connecticut, mm. and then I went into Marine Corps for three years. And after the Marine Corps, I said, you know what? If that didn't between football and the Marine Corps, if that didn't kill me, the theater won't. So I went to UConn for my MFA in playwriting, actually. In playwriting. Yeah, I, I still dabble a little bit. You know, I like to write, and I love to work on new plays. I, I the last line of my bio. Is I don't do plays by old dead white guys. <laughs> There's so many good young writers out there yeah. that need an opportunity. So. But but, growing up where you grew up and growing up as a jock, as you yeah. as you say, the theater piece of it, and also being Italian American. Yeah. I know it, it may be an odd question, but I want to ask it anyway. Was this interest that you had supported by others around you? Um, definitely. My uh, Aunt Adele lived with us for a while, and I'd come home from practice, and she'd say, go to bed early. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, she'd wake me up and go, James Cagney. And we'd go down and watch the Late Late Show. So that was my first interest. And then in college, I remember my first play. I studied with a very famous woman, Miss Constance Welsh. And my father came up and said, Dad, come up for the game, but stay. I'm in a play. Goes, what? You, you're in a play? <laughs> and after the play was over, I said, what do you think? And he goes, I don't know anything about this stuff. And he went over and talked to Miss Welsh in her 70s then. And he came back and he said, you know, the old lady thinks you're pretty good. Maybe you ought to stick with this. And I said, you you don't, you really think so, Dad? Mm -hmm. And he says, well, if you work as hard in this as you do in football, you'll be all right. It's about as good as it gets, right? Yeah. And when you see the kids in the, our show, you know, Johnny Rabe and uh, Zach Ballard, the young kids, all the kids, they dance, they sing. I'm the least talented person in the room, trust me. But that's what I tell these kids. If you're this far now, if this becomes your love, you're going to be okay. These kids all come to you for advice? Well, yeah, because I'm on record. Looking at them right, we're just on oh, yeah. the shot right there. They, do they, they do come to you. Well, yeah, we talk a lot, especially because of the Wonder Years. It's on Netflix now, so the kids, these kids are watching it for the first time. 
Yeah. And I'm on record when somebody asks me what's the best thing you've ever done or what are you most proud of is that all the kids on the Wonder Years are doing great. Talk about that because that is so rare. Yeah, they, uh, uh, Winnie Cooper, Danica McKellar has written her fourth math book. What? Yes. And her she, fourth math book. Winnie Cooper. Yes. And she's gorgeous. So we all had gorgeous. a crush on day who Kevin had a crush on. Yes. And she's still stunning. And why they don't put her on a series and capitalize on this positive instead of the negative of some of these. But is she, is she in, hold on. She's is still she acting, yeah. But she's a mathematical genius. Fred Savage is one of our leading directors of Three Camera. Josh Saviano, the other nerdy friend, sure. Paulie, he became an entertainment lawyer, and he is the lawyer for Spider-Man. <laughs> and Jason Hervey, uh, the older son, right. he's one of the leading producers in reality shows. So the young kids in this show, when we I talk about that, but you have to have a passion for what you do. Don't get involved with the drugs. My drug is acting. It always has been, always will be. I love it. I have a great time. The kids make fun of me because I can't sing, but I have fun with that. You know. But, but I ask you, we'll go back to the play in, in a second. Um, but I am curious about this. During the Wonder Years. When you were with that cast and it was happening and it was so incredibly popular, yeah. How did your life change? Well, for me, it didn't because I'm a character actor. There is no one thing that makes you. I was working a lot before the Wonder Years. I mean, I wasn't a household. Well, I'm still not a household name, but when they see my face, but, but, they say but, that dad of the Wonder Years. Yeah, but yeah. in and of itself, by being the dad on the Wonder Years, that. Didn't change your life? No, but I was very fortunate because uh, my mentor is Charles Durning, who's still with oh. us, he's 89, and oh, Jack Klugman, who's still with us, who's 91. Right. You know, and every time Charlie ever saw me in a play, he'd put his arm around me and he'd say, uh, another 20 years, you'll be an actor. <laughs> and then a few years ago, he saw me in a play, it was one of Jack Klugman's last plays. We were really good. And Charlie put his arm around me and he said, all right, another 10 years. <laughs> so I've looked at him after all these years and I said, are you an actor yet? And the great Charles Sterling said, I'm getting damn close. And that's what I try to teach the kids. Work for that perfection. You know, the play is never set. So the whole thing, like, I want to get there. There is no there. Talk about that. I mean, to have a goal that you can't possibly reach is the best thing in life. Because you're always striving. It's always the next show. It's always the next performance. You know, that's why I love the theater, because I know I'm going to screw up sometime. And the next night, I get a chance to correct it. And then when things work perfect and you think, oh, it's set, that's when Charlie and Lombardi. Exactly. You're not there yet. Yeah. Perfection, perfection. Uh, real quick, I'm gonna, I, 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 wanna, I screwed up because after the show, I'm going to say I didn't give you enough of a chance to, to plug ah, uh, the, the, uh, <laughs> the Christmas story, the musical. Set in Indiana in the 1940s, Ralphie is the boy. His Christmas wish is he wants a BB gun. Yes. Okay, plug and it. You know Go what ahead. the mother says. She says. You're going to shoot your eye out. <laughs> You're going to shoot your eye out. You know what Santa out. says. You're going to shoot your eye out. And one of the greatest numbers in the play is you're going to shoot your eye out. And uh, Caroline O'Connor, she just brings down a house. Brings down a house. And we get this little kid, Luke, nine years old, who won the Fred Astaire Award, where he has to duplicate a, a Fred Astaire routine. Nine. He not only tap dances, he tap dances on his toes. What? I'm telling you, I'm the least talented guy in the room. I can't sing, I can't dance. These kids act, they dance. Are you in awe of these kids? Oh, uh, totally. Totally, totally. You know, I wish I had started that young, you know. So, but they like it that at the end of the play, I can get everybody to cry a little, and so I and you're the bail out at the end. And by the way, we just want to remind everyone that Dan is a narrator. Uh, plug again. It's playing at the Lundfontein Theater. Lundfontein Theater, A Christmas Story, the musical. Uh, we open November 5th for preview. Close December 30th. Before I let you out of here, um, I think I can just tell from just sitting across from you for a few minutes. You could have done a lot of different things. You chose to do this. It chose you. I don't know. Yeah. Um, how fortunate do you feel that this has been the life, professional life you chose? Oh, it's, it's great. I couldn't, uh, well, you know, we were talking about sports before. I'm still in the game. I'm not coaching on the sidelines <laughs> or watching on TV. I'm still in the game. So 
to be my age at this stage of the game to still be playing, great. It's so funny. I, I often think the same thing, and, and I know it sounds like such a cliche and so corny, but behind you, I'm looking behind you. I don't know if it, Terry, tell me in this. Tell me this. Behind Dan, I see the sign Broadway. <laughs> okay, is that actually in the real shot? Okay. In my wacky head, right? Mm -hmm. I'll never actually be on Broadway, Broadway. In my head, I'm thinking, I'm in TV. Yeah. I'm on Broadway. I'm on Broadway. <laughs> and in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm in the game. Yeah. I'm talking to Dan Loria. This is as good as it gets. Isn't it? Aren't we fortunate? So this is everybody the best. should come I'm in. on TV with you. Get out of here. Two bisons. <laughs> We're having a good time. We're talking about what we love to do. Lombardi would have been proud. I hope so. I think he would I have been I hope so. Too. That was always my question. I'm proud of you. Yeah, that listen. was always my question. Would the coach have enjoyed this? Listen, I cannot thank you enough. It is an honor to have you here. Oh, you have an open invitation on public television. Oh, and you have an invitation to the show. Come All backstage. You got it. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET Studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Hackensack University Medical Center, Berkeley College, TD Bank, Qualcare Inc a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents. The law firm of Gibbons PC, Verizon Communications, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger and NJ.com, everything Jersey, and by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and its monthly magazine, New Jersey Business. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One on One with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System. I'm John Campbell, Berkeley College, class of 98, associate's degree in paralegal studies. I'm Busi Matsiko Andan, Berkeley College class of 2004, bachelor's degree in business administration. Melvin Montalvo, class of 91 and 2003 degrees in accounting and management. Simi Papachin, class of 2001, bachelor's degree in business administration. From different walks of life, our students succeed in different ways, yet their first step is exactly the same. Berkeley College. Hello, I'm Rafael P. Roman. And I'm Steve Adubato. Join us every week on New Jersey Capital Report. Because we'll ask the questions that you want and need answered. Airing on NJTV. 13 and WHYY. Check your local listings.